Um, we are picking up on the Homeless Bill of Rights, H-492. Um, Luke has provided us with a draft that incorporates many, if not all, of the requests that we made last week. Luke, could you join us? Sure. Is that the draft that you gave you a minute? Quickly. You can work off it if you like. I don't need to. I just want to check on something. Thank you. General Assembly, I'm here on 492. What I try to put together is a working document, so it's not the polished or final potential strike law amendment. And it shows highlighted in yellow, I'm sorry, uh, the changes that I think we had agreed to. And it also contains stricken language, which normally wouldn't be in an amendment. And that's just to show you what's being taken out. So it's a way to work through the changes I believe you had agreed to, and then of course we can discuss. So starting on page one, three, line 18, there's discussion about adding in perceived. And so I did it here, and you'll see later that I do it in other sections. And I think it might be easier to bypass section two for right now, section two and three, and jump to later parts of the bill. And I'll just show you the changes that were made. And this is now in the subsequent sections that are dealing with existing anti-discrimination law. So it's not talking about the Homeless Bill of Rights section, it's talking about the later sections of the bill. For example, on page nine, at the very top, this is the definition of housing status. So it's still cross-referencing the federal law as you decided, but it added in actual or perceived. And I don't think we need to, I did that in the subsequent definitions also. So every time we have a definition of housing status that you are adding as a protected category to existing anti-discrimination law, we're still cross-referencing the federal definition, but I added in actual or perceived. And that language is consistent every time we have that definition. Any questions about that? Okay, so now let's go to section two, which was the section in Title I, the Homeless Bill of Rights. And if you go to page four, you'll see there's a new F added. It starts on line five. So there's discussion about a couple terms. One was housing status, and one was public place or public space. And you decided to always use the phrase public space. You'll see F, as in Frank, starting on line five, you see one housing status. Now these definitions are in this section. They're at the end. You could have put them in the beginning. There's no difference in their impact. I merely put them at the end because uh, it might be easier to read. But this is just really a formatting issue. But housing status means the actual or perceived status of being homeless, et cetera, and then it cross-references the federal statute. So this is exactly word for word the same definition that would be in Title IX, the same definitions that you're now including in the existing anti-discrimination laws. So exactly the same. Did you combine the two, Luke? Is that what you're saying? No. I repeated the same definition okay. more than once and added in the words actual or perceived okay. each time. Okay. But so before housing, homelessness and housing status wasn't really defined in this section, the right. so-called homeless okay. bill of rights. Yeah. Now it is defined and defined exactly the same way okay. as it's later defined in Title IX, okay. et cetera. So it's that Title IX. Yeah. Thank you. Is that clear? Yes. Now then there's a definition of public space. And let's walk through this because this is all new. This is meant to incorporate my understanding of your decisions from last time. This wasn't defined earlier, so now we're defining this term. And so I believe what we asked you to do was to make this definition and then we put it back on the table side by side with the concept of public accommodation. 
public accommodation is, is a common definition in our statutes already, so that we had asked Luke to come up with this, mm -hmm. and then we will have that discussion, right. as, and, and we can change that or delete it or, okay. or rely on public accommodation. We'll have that conversation. Sure. And so let's walk through this public space. So once again, every time I said public place, I change it to public space so there's consistency. Public space means any space or location that is customarily open to, accessible to, or used by the general public and includes. So these are examples now, but they're not exhaustive. So these are examples, but it, but it doesn't mean it's a whole universe. Outdoor spaces, including sidewalks, streets, village greens, and public parks and beaches. And indoor spaces, including shopping malls, libraries, town halls, community centers, and government buildings. So now we've defined public space and given some examples of what are public spaces. And then B, this is sort of a carve out, does not mean restaurants, stores, schools, religious establishments, or indoor spaces that are not customarily open to the general public or that require the payment of a fee or membership to enter. This is only an attempt to put into statutory language your discussion. So of course you can change and modify, and maybe it didn't hit all the points that you want to include. But you see what I was trying to do is have a general, broad understanding of public space and then pull things out of it like the inside of a store or a restaurant. Does letter B um, reflect the definition of public accommodation? To some extent, because remember public accommodation includes the restaurant mm -hmm. and the store. Mm -hmm. And my understanding of where you were headed or potentially headed was to exclude those. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to pull them out. So it's, it's narrower than a public accommodation in that regard. Okay. Should, should we think about a term that would include um, access gained with a key? Mm. So a store owner possibly going into their establishment and unlocking the door in the morning or I can't think of any other example of a public restroom that requires accommodation. Yeah. And, and you're thinking you want to allow well, that's what I'm, I'm all these people access. or deny them access to that? Well, that's add to the bottom of this definition, definition where, where you're carving out where it requires payment of a fee or membership to enter, or someone who has access to a key to whatever. So good, good question. Um, and th I don't think that space that's locked, mm -hmm. nor a secure part of a building, government building, <clears throat> can have rooms that are not customarily open to the general public. Okay. So, so you could absolutely list more examples. You could mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. But I thought things that are secure location, um, the, the general public cannot customarily right. enter, that's not included in the definitions. That would be a locked space. Yeah. That would be a part of the General Assembly, the police office. Mm -hmm. You can't all walk in there. That's true. Therefore, all the doors can walk in either. Yeah. Examples like that. Yeah. So. Representative Zoff. Uh, I thought, or at least my preference was, mm -hmm. I don't know if it was the committees or what, I didn't think shopping malls were, I thought we had a discussion that shopping malls were not public spaces. Like the idea, again, of, yeah. of setting up a, some kind of food distribution in the middle of the shopping mall, I thought we had heard some well, of that, That's your decision make. The sense I got was the general areas of the shopping mall you did want to allow homeless people access to, but the individual stores or restaurants you did not. But that's a, that's a policy decision. Well, it wasn't so much about, in the context of the discussion, it wasn't so much about access for homeless people. It was about, there was, in some other section of the bill, there's a talk about, the, about being able to distribute food and it yep. should not be prohibited. Mm -hmm. And so, again, if like Food Not Bombs, an organization that distributes food to the homeless, wanted to set up inside a shopping mall, I don't, I wouldn't support a lot that said they could set up inside the shopping mall. Okay. But they wanted to set up outside the shopping mall, yeah, but inside, no. It's not a public space, it's a private space, privately owned, privately operated, the whole thing, so. Or they would ask permission. Right, of course. They have to ask permission. Of course, yeah. I think maybe we continue this discussion at a point when you might 
not have been here. And that's where this might have come from. Do you want me to walk through the rest of the changes? I, I think there'll be more discussion about this key definitional <coughs> term. But do you want me to walk through the rest of them? Yeah, do you want to start? Yeah, let's do that and then we can. So let's now uh, go to section two and let's go to page two, please. And on page two and three, there's highlighted changes. I just want to go through them with you. Um, first one is on page two, lines two and three. Because housing status is now a defined term, you don't need to say homeless or because of their housing status. So the change you see there in lines two and three is just removing the language that's no longer necessary. And you'll see I do that repeatedly on the rest of the page. So you don't need to say homelessness, for example, each time. Now, you, I did not, you could condense this whole section. Um, there's, there's some repetitious language. I did not do that because I was only trying to make the changes you agreed to. But if you wish, you, you could, there's other language you could take out that may not be necessary. I don't think it's harmful. I don't think it's negative, but you could condense it. <coughs> Going over to page three. Now this language on four, five, six, seven, and eight that I struck out. This, I didn't know if it was necessary. You did not uh, reach an explicit decision to remove it. So this is something that uh, you hadn't really discussed or decided. But it struck me that it may not be necessary in light of the other changes in housing status map now being a defined term. That's something you should look at and decide whether you want that language in or out. And do you say that in the sense that that the, that the way it's other, otherwise defined is more global, so that so that this can be? I mean, I I, I look at this language and I and I say, okay, we 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 singled out victims of domestic and sexual violence in this particular case because we we felt it wasn't covered in other sections. Well, if that's so, then maybe you, you want to keep it in. And once again, it wasn't something you discussed. So I'm clear with that. It struck me four and five, what does that language actually do? So it's almost a statement of your intent and your opinion. But it doesn't, you say they have the right, but it doesn't actually do anything specific. So that, that's something for you to discuss. Okay. You could certainly have the language there. The other language, I was, it was unclear to me whether it changed anything legally. And that's also something if you discuss and maybe hear testimony from other stakeholders concerning. So I'm not sure about this, but I was wondering whether um, it was necessary or if you're really just saying that confidentiality as mandated by other laws should be followed. And if that's so, it may not be necessary to repeat it here. The other la changes that you see on page three are just referencing the term of housing status or striking out um, without housing, which is no longer necessary, or traditional for a public fora was stricken out at the very bottom of the page and public spaces was used instead. So it's just um, changes in language to be consistent. And those are all the changes that were made in this draft. Okay, so um, committee first, I guess, let's put aside the conversation of public space versus public accommodation for a minute and just concentrate on the other changes that were made. Is, does it reflect everything that we were talking about last week, in your opinion? And then we, um, we'll come back to the domestic violence language in a but the other changes seem to be um, making it consistent, making the changes that we requested and making them consistent through there. Is that, do we achieve that here? Yes, Lisa. I think for the majority of the committee, it probably does myself. I'm still, um, I'm concerned with the actual or perceived language. So that's a stumbling block for me. But I think the rest of the committee is pretty, it, it captures what we were talking about, minus the public space issue, which you asked us to remove. 
for marble heights? <clears throat> for the time being. Yeah. Um, and there's, um, then let's quick this move over to domestic the domestic violence language. Do we think that that is, um, I mean, it, Luke, if you needed to look at that, would you need to look at that one more time in terms of research? to determine whether or not it's completely duplicative, or is it just our choice? Well, I, I think you should, that's something you may want to hear from other uh, stakeholders, either informally or formally. Um, it's not my subject area. I can't give you an opinion. That's absolutely not necessary. I think I explained my reasoning and yeah. striking it out, but I would circle back to some of the other folks who have testified, perhaps. Okay. I, I think the, the, the language on four and five, I don't see what that adds. The other language, um, six, seven, and eight, that's what I'm not certain about. So. And of course, you could just keep it all in and yeah. have these issues talked about in the next committee at those two. So. All right. Does the um, reference to the Federal Violence Against Women's Act, are you familiar with that? No, I'm not. Of the, okay. I, I'm not familiar with that law specifically, no, I'm not. Because on the face of it, given the other uh, on the face of it, it would seem that the Where do you see language the on, on, on page three, yeah. line two. And oh, I'm sorry. I was looking at strict language. I'm sorry. Gotcha. Um, <clears throat> because on the face of it, it would seem that the, uh, the additional language uh, might just be um, duplicative. Well, that, that's what I was wondering, but yeah. I'm not entirely sure, so and I cannot need, answer that question. We need to know what that, yeah. what that language says. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, and, I, and I hear you when you say that um, this sentence, starting with in particular, um, is more of a statement that if we were to include that language anywhere in the bill, it would be in the findings. Yeah. More than more than within the statute itself. <clears throat> um, any other thoughts on that language right now on page three about about um, this no identifying information, etc. All right, so that's still a touch point to go back to. Um, now, public spaces versus public accommodations. Um, I believe that if we, in the testimony we had last week also mentioned that public accommodation does include most of these things, is that right? Yes, it does include, I'm sorry, it does include um, things like stores, and let me uh, read that definition to you again. Title IX, and it says, place of public accommodation means any school, restaurant, store, establishment, or other facility at which services, facilities, goods, privileges, advantages, benefits, or accommodations are offered to the general public. And so it's quite broad, but it would include a restaurant, uh, a store. That specific and many other um, places. So public accommodation does include the things that I excluded in that definition. And all of our other protected classes that we're bringing homeless population into, it's public accommodation is what is guaranteed. 
Well, and anti-discrimination. Yes, yes, but you do that in this bill also. Remember, there's in this bill you have changes to Title IX, public accommodation. Right. You're adding housing status as a new protected category, so they get the full panoply of protections like race, gender, sexual orientation, etc. We're talking now about Section 2, which is the Homeless Bill of Rights, which is different than Title IX, and which has different types of language. That's what we're talking about right now. So uh, I'm a, a little, if, it, if I'm understanding, I'm a little uncomfortable because I feel like we're creating an apartheid system that all our protected classes can take advantage of all of this, but now suddenly restaurants were saying, yeah. Uh, it can be like whites only, and, 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 but it's, it's like excluding homeless people. So you're not doing that. I'm sorry if I was unclear. Under this bill, you're giving homeless people access to places of public accommodation like everyone else. That's in Section 4. Okay. The, the B, B part. Section 4A, 4502. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm stuck. Um, no, he's, so, so what, so I, let me, okay. yeah, let me back up, sorry if I was unclear. The bill's different parts. Okay. There's aspects of the bill that adds housing status to the existing law about public accommodations. So how homeless people under those sections of this bill, same rights, um, same privileges, treated the same way as other protected classes, okay. such as race, gender, okay. et cetera. Okay. Section 2 is different than Title IX. Section 2 is a homeless bill of rights and talks about distributing services and parks and things like that. That's what we're talking about right now. And there's no comparable bill, uh, no comparable law for race, gender, sexual orientation like the homeless bill of rights. Is that clear? So what what is... <clears throat> Uh, page 4, yep. B, 16, 17, 18. What does that exclude? What aspects of this is our... It means as to the Homeless Bill of Rights, which is Section 2. Okay. Forget, totally different than the other Title IX changes. Okay. Right. So it's saying for what you have in Section 2 doesn't apply to restaurants, stores, schools, religious establishments, etc. And this includes, if you look at the prior pages on Section 2, it's talking about using and moving freely in public spaces, um, et cetera. This doesn't limit what you're changing in Title IX. Some of it may be a little bit redundant, but it also goes further than what you're changing in Title IX. It's talking about um, use and move freely in public spaces. It has a language about you can't have uh, sanctions <coughs> or being in public spaces, etc. I, I don't see why that D is necessary at all. I, mean, I would think the broader public accommodation covers it for me. Well, as I recall the discussion, there was a concern about the um, on page three. Item C, the ability to offer food. Um, it's just a little vague, and there was some concern that that language would authorize or allow someone to be um, exempt from criminal or civil sanctions if they set up a soup kitchen in a restaurant. And we thought that's probably not a reasonable a reasonable interpretation of things, and we were, so we were specifying that it's public spaces and not public accommodations, so that we wouldn't be in a situation where that would happen. I think that, that was the whole reason I thought we were delineating, delineating the difference between public space mm -hmm. and public accommodation. I was think that's correct. I agree. Mm -hmm. Right, that, that was what, I'm not saying whether that's right or not, I'm just saying that's what engendered the discussion was that language as it reads, <coughs> seems to allow for that possibility. And so I wonder if we can, without creating a definition that can cause confusion in in that line, on, in that section C, um, reiterate other language around um, interfering with um, 
so no person shall be subject to civil or criminal sanctions for da 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 as long as it does not interfere with the normal operation of the business or normal um, conduct because we've been we've been very clear along the way that that a business uh, that we want to make maintain that a business has a right to refuse service for someone who is interfering with the, the business practices that are going on. Or like disrupting the staff, the yeah, sure. customer. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, and and so that's, that's been the, the conversation all along. We want to ma maintain that right. And so right, like the, the um, example that you're offering of what we were trying to avoid, I wonder if we can have I'm now just repeating myself, but in this section, as long as it does not interfere with the normal business, and then we can use the public accommodations language and not have dual definitions. I'm seeing some head nods. So yeah, they're right. I'm just like walking yeah. through yeah. that. It, 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 it yeah. don't make sense to me. So what you're suggesting is that, again, we have three different sections, right? So again, we're not talking about the discrimination sections. This is just in the Bill of Rights, right? Mm -hmm. So what you're suggesting is that we, if, if I heard you correctly, mm -hmm. what you're suggesting is to not use this definition of a public space, but to, so to allow public accommodation would be the same definition in both sections. Mm -hmm but to put a proviso in here mm -hmm. that then says that whether it's our intent or it's our mm -hmm. interpretation or mm -hmm. whatever it is mm -hmm. that to, to, to your, yeah. to your ex exclusionary language, if you will. Yeah, yeah. But that leads me to ask uh, what is in current statute, for example, in a restaurant uh, with other protected classes, is there any kind of language at all? Again, I think that yes, there is. There is the whole, the whole, I think that's the point that Luke was making is that under the discrimination law that we have, we're adding housing status to this where public accommodation is a part of the definition. And that, but again, that this section of, of the bill, which goes into a different section of law, Right. I understand. You know, if, again, we may be using the we. If the proposal would be to say use the same definition with an exclusion to it. Well, that's what I'm kind of looking for. Is there existing language, for example, you know, if you refuse to serve somebody in a restaurant because of perceived religion? I think we took testimony that that was that that was part of the reason for adding perceived to the homeless is that the, the legal tradition is. Racial discrimination can be perceived. You know, if you misperceive someone as right. you, there was an example of Muslim versus Hindu versus you know, and so I think what you're getting to is how you prove the case, yeah. and it's always fact specific, <coughs> and it's hard to um, control a really clear line. But I'm just wondering so, if there is um, not existing yes. language we can just adapt. To. No. Not that I'm aware of, but okay. so if you go into a restaurant and I'm not going to serve you because you're a person of color. Mm -hmm. or because you're gender non-conforming, pretty easy case to prove. Yeah. But if you go into a restaurant and they just don't serve you, and they don't tell you why, then you would have to establish what seems to be the reason, and that has to do with the burden of proof. So I'm not aware of any language and statute that really helps make that easier or that we could use. You could try to develop it if you want, but it's always going to be case-specific and fact-dependent. Which was also testified by the Human um, Rights Commission. Lisa? So, this is probably a very elementary question that I should have asked a long time ago, but <clears throat> with the clarity between the anti discrimination and the Bill of Rights, why are we pursuing writing a Bill of Rights when presumably the status, housing status, would be covered if we just included it in the anti discrimination hmm. Title IX? When we're writing a Bill of Rights, this is, the Bill of Rights is, is not about, it's different from the discrimination law. This is, this, this is us making a statement that people who are experiencing homelessness are doing X. Yeah, that's what I thought. I just 
because I don't really see it necessary, maybe, if a person's rights are going to be covered under Title IX if we add another protected class, which is housing status. And you don't have to answer that. I, I think I have my answer. Mm -hmm. Uh, two summers ago, I, on Church Street, I walked into Starbucks, and Philip Ruth was there, and he was had his sign up, uh, you know, to his petition to run for Senate. And he was just standing there quietly and doing that, and oh, I said, "Hey, how are you, Senator Ruth? Nice to see you." And I signed his petition and stuff. And so, if he was unkempt and homeless, according to what we're talking about now, he would not be able to be there. But because he was looking good and quiet, he could be there because he was wasn't actively soliciting, but he had his signatures things here. And you know, oh, you live in Chittenden County? Oh, I do. And oh, well, I'm gathering signatures for my petition to run. And so that, that's my discomfort here is that we're not asking restaurants. People are, should be served if they, if they come and sit down and they have money. They should be served, no matter who they are. Yeah. But if he, if he was, if he was, if he was, if he was harassing people, if he was aggressively asking for signatures, that's the that's the point of difference there. Well, so if he's, if he's the perception here, of how he looked. No, I'm not speaking to that at all. I'm talking about the the method of engagement with the public as an operator has absolutely nothing to do with one's physical appearance and demeanor, well, a little bit on the demeanor side, but physical appearance, how they come up. If he was standing there calmly having conversations with people like yourself, asking for petitions, have that. So, e democracy. I take well, that. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah. I just want to be clear that all of these discussions, it comes down to how do you prove your case. Yeah. So you put it on paper, the shop owner does whatever they wish, it matters whether the case is brought, and that gets to proof of case. So even if you add language that can interfere with normal operations of the business, um, home, uh, sorry, shop owner could still exclude you if you're unkempt and smelly if they think that's, arguably, they think that's interfering with normal operation of business. So no matter what you're trying to get to, there's always going to be some wiggle room. There's always going to be some gray area. It's always going to come down to does someone bring a case how do they prove it? Can they meet the burden of proof? I just want to make that clear. So where does that put us? Where does that put us right this second with public accommodation versus public spaces? Well, if, if I'm the only outlier on this, and I, I don't really know where other people stand, I, Willing to go with the group, but I, I'm still uncomfortable with it. But if, if I'm not voted, we're, we're done with this. If consensus is, but um, so. Yeah, I mean, I think that public accommodation language has um, is clear uh, because it's in precedent and it and it uh, we're doing a new thing, and, and so having. Fewer new things. Um, I think it's always helpful um, as you make changes. So uh, that's that's my preference. And it seems like with that additional language to make sure to uh, to acknowledge the intent of this bill and to reiterate the um, businesses being able to operate functionally mm -hmm. is, is the intent. And so that's uh, I'm standing in that. Well, I mean, this is like sort of like the the new uncharted territory of creating one of these, <clears throat> doing one of these constructs where it's not necessarily looking at someone for race, gender, religion, mm -hmm. and it's more of a social construct as opposed to how somebody's born or a point of faith. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I think that's where we're running into this. You, you, you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like this has never been defined before for this type of individual. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why we're hitting some. So correct me if I'm wrong, Luke. Mm -hmm. If if 
it appears to me that we're defining public spaces yes. and we're backing out public accommodations out of that definition. Is some, that safe? some part of public accommodations. Right. Yes, right. you are. That's safe to say. Yes. I don't think we have a problem with that. I think it's fairly clear. I think just to be super pedantic about this this item C, when it says no person shall be subject to civil or criminal sanctions for soliciting, sharing, accepting, or offering food, right? As you said, in the normal operation of business, yes, but in John's example, we're at Starbucks. I'm, a, I'm an upstart coffee company, and I decide to go to Starbucks and offer coffee samples to people of a competing brand. Yeah. This seems to say that I'm exempt from any consequence of that. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm not subject to any criminal or civil sanction for setting up a coffee sample distribution within Starbucks. But could you be asked to leave under present law? I mean, well, that's, that's what I, that's, I, I think that's the problem that we're trying to figure out here. Right. I mean, that's just, it's just that simple. What's well, that got to do with homelessness? Just, I guess is my question. You're, you're exactly yeah, I think right. that's the point he's trying to make. Right. It does, that's what it I'm has thinking. nothing to do with the fact that the person is but perceived homeless. Right. I, I don't think that's accurate under the language in the bill now. It doesn't, C doesn't specifically have the words um, housing status, but the whole section talks about housing status as the characteristic you're trying to prevent discrimination on. So if Luke Marland's Coffee went to Starbucks and started handing out samples, I don't think I'd be within C. But we could, we could make that clear if you want to. We could absolutely make that clear. Well, I mean, it, then who's offering the food right. in that situation? It, it could be Randall's Coffee Company offering coffee to right, homeless but I'm people. Saying, you, you, mm -hmm. Oh, you're I, offering it to homeless people? I thought you were handing it out to... You, he yeah, could be offering it to anybody. No, no, no. I, yeah. I'm saying the, the, the wording in there is offering food. Yeah. If it was accepting and you left out offering, then... Oh, I see what you're saying. You see what I'm saying? The offering implies that you're the person who has the resources that you're then allocating to someone else. If you just left out offering, you just said sharing or accepting. I mean, sharing's a little, but mm -hmm. anyway. It's just now I understand. Right, right. Yeah, that's why. Yes, that's clear. And, and then the, the point that I made earlier when we talked about this is that at the U.S.-Mexico border that uh, municipalities have criminalized mm -hmm. uh, giving uh, Food. food and water, and so that's that's the perspective that I'm coming from. The, um, that uh, I, I I do not want to be doing that. And so again, that that additional language of how to have within uh, how to have language that says interfering with the normal business, so that the example of Randall you're having is not not within this protected. But did you want C to cover your scenario at the border or not cover it? Um, when we talked about it initially, um, that's what my understanding was, was that it was um, that you could give or receive um, and to be covered. It's separate from homeless status, you could give uh, or receive. In the, in the context of homeless status. In the context of homeless yeah. status. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Lisa, and Tom. Um, so, I come back to perceive. That's a very loaded word. And, and that would mean to me, in terms of public spaces, this is a public space, this building. We have a homeless person, at least one, who comes and goes and so on. So I'm interpreting this, if I approach that person, as actually has been done when this person first appeared, one particular person I'm thinking of, um, and there was an outreach of help offered because it was perceived the person was in need, regardless of whether or not this was a homeless person, because that was not anything that was clear initially. So if I reach out to this person to offer them some sort of help, service, or what have you, under this law, I could be accused of being um, Discriminatory? No. 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 This happens to be a homeless person. I know, but this says no person no, no. shall be. Right. No, no person shall be subject to. This is in the sanctions. context of a business. Right. As I understand it. To go to another committee to do an amendment. That's going to be in the floor today. Can I then circle back to you after that? 
I'm sorry. Yes, in committee we have we're, we are going to move on to another um, another topic at um, ten o'clock. We we have to, um, and then we at ten thirty we go on the floor. So yeah, we can check back. So we will we'll continue our policy you. conversation sure. here. So I think um, thank you. Thank and you. We'll I'm sorry, you. I have to go to the other committee. Um, uh, and just as you're leaving, of course, classic. If we decide on status quo of public spaces and whatnot, sure. this, these changes reflect that. If we choose to go with public accommodations, then the changes you have to make are going to be changing public spaces to public accommodations. Yeah, it's pretty easy to do. And I just cross reference the definition of public accommodation and blah, blah, blah. Very easy to do. Take out the definition of public spaces, keep the definition of homeless status, keep that in. So and then, you could and easily then, do that, not that difficult. And then the proviso, we would get you yeah. the idea of what that sure. proviso would be. And it could add that language in also. So okay. Sure. Thank you. Let me know what you need. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa? So I just want to respond to um, Deanna that I get the, the Mexican border um, Example, and when you first offered that, I came back with, um, you're in a restaurant, you're a paying patron, there is someone there who is not a paying patron, who's just, who's sitting there, and you bring in food from outside, you don't buy it at the restaurant, and you start handing it out to people. That would seem to me that it's something that should not be allowed at that restaurant. And if the restaurant owner um, asked you to stop doing it and to leave, but you proved that the person that you were helping was homeless, how is that person who was offering the food or water covered under this? That person probably wouldn't be, that person could be prosecuted for handing out food because they perceived the person to be homeless. So, and, and I know that you missed some discussions that we've had since then, but I think that's why we're still stuck on letter C. And, and that's, I'm hearing that you and I are, are in agreement. Because, I think so. Because that I, um, I think the, the restaurant um, is well within its rights, and we need to make clear in letter C that that we we want to reiterate well within its rights to say you cannot come in here and give food from outside to other people because that interrupts my normal business. And so we're we're in agreement on that. Yeah. So if you're buying food at that restaurant and giving it to somebody who's sitting next to you, yeah, you can sure away. Info, that's yeah. that's great. <laughs> yeah. But I don't. I don't, get to I don't, I don't <laughs> I don't think Section C is doing that. I don't think Section C is saying what you and I want to say. And so then, then um, do you agree with me that if there, if we, if we reiterate our intention of um, not interfering with a normal business, da, 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 because in the, the example you just said of, of um, I invite a stranger that I don't know to eat dinner with me, or I'm finished with my meal and there's still half a plate left, and I let somebody finish that for me. I'm giving away food. That that is within the an operation, a normal restaurant operation, and is giving food. It it might be. I don't I don't agree with the giving away the leftover food part. And this is all this is all coming down to it's too specific for me. There are too many. If sands and butts, and I, I, I can't get into the weeds of this Bill of Rights part. It's just too much. I've got a proposed solution, uh, agreeing with both of you, uh, is that we go back to the original definitions of public places and public accommodations as defined in Title IX, and not try to redefine any of that. That we include language that addresses not interfering with a normal operation of a business, and perhaps adding one more proviso, or with the permission of. So obviously, if a restaurant says, hey, it's OK for you to come in and end up something. Oh, no, totally. And it's fine. Like, add at it. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's like your thing. Right. Do it. Yeah. 
Yeah, and maybe that would just clarify a lot of this. Mm -hmm. Going back to the original definitions of public uh, places, places, right, and public accommodations, and having the two provisos. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, obviously we'd have to see it laid out, yes. but nothing, nothing about that's yeah. Yeah, concerning. So Tom, just write up some of that. Oh, good lord. Yeah. <laughs> you <know>? Really? <laughs> yeah, you gotta put that Yes, really. No, right yeah. before the, because you just, it's like a show, it's like when my wife gives me a shopping list. The first three <laughs> items I can remember. Yes, yeah. four, but please write it down. The last ten, <laughs> you are out. You know, because I'll forget the first thing on the list. Um, I only have capacity for three things at once. <laughs> I probably already forgot. I mean, I think of that. All you need to do is do this as a bullet point so we can share this with, with sure. Luke if this is the right direction we end up going in. Um, I, to me, that bridges what we've been discussing, the way you, I should just say about <clears throat> All right, before we take a break, before the next conversation, um, Earhart, you had your hand up six or seven times. Uh, <laughs> did you want to share thoughts on anything? If, if you have time, yeah, appreciate it. We have four and a half minutes. Um, should I do it from here, or do you need me to? Aramanka, Affordable Housing Coalition. Um, so I think you're getting to, uh, from my perspective, a better place with uh, Representative Waltz's uh, suggestion. Uh, two things that I wanted to point out. Um, one was you're focusing a lot on the restaurants and the malls uh, and the provision of food or, and these sorts of things. But I just want to make sure that you understand that in um, on page two, um, in B1, uh, there's a much broader um, conveyance of rights to use and move freely in public spaces, including sidewalks, et cetera, et cetera. And if you do create a separate definition from what's in Title IX, the public accommodations definition, if you include a more restrictive definition in the Bill of Rights, um, that is, you are potentially uh, creating a conflict um, between the uh, Public Accommodations Act and specifically this section, uh, B1, which conveys the right to use and move freely in public spaces, um, including all, all those listed. And you're basically, you would be creating, I think, conflict and confusion in the minds of mall owners and business people about whether or not they could maybe under one section of law prevent someone who is homeless or perceived to be homeless from entering their establishment um, or entering their mall um, and another section of law which says they need to be able to uh, serve them uh, like they would any other member of the public. So just, I know you're focusing on the other two places where public spaces are. Well, no, I think the question to Luke was, if we go with public accommodations yeah. as the definition, that that would change here, that that would change this one as well. That, that's my interpretation. Yeah. That's what you're asking for, is to change the, any reference to a public space to an accommodation because it's a broader definition, yes. and, and you're seeking the continuity between two different sections. Right. I, I was speaking to if you kept the uh, proposed definition for public spaces in the Bill of Rights section, as Luke had outlined earlier, then you would be creating a potential conflict um, with um, the Public Accommodations Act. And I just want to make sure that among, you know, while you're focusing on the restaurants and malls and providing food or, you know, whatever, you know, things that, like, normally any owner would say, please don't do this here, and the person would leave, um, I, you know, I, with the great focus on that, I think what you're not looking maybe at as much is uh, B1, and so if you did go with Luke's proposed public um, space um, definition, then I think you're creating a conflict under this section. So I think you're in a better place with uh, what, what uh, Representative Waltz was suggesting. The other thing I just wanted to make you aware of is on page um, three, the, um, this is uh, in section six, uh, 
top of page three, lines four through seven, um, Luke had suggested striking um, the, um, the mis uh, victims of domestic and sexual violence uh, and stalking uh, components. My recollection back to when uh, we originally worked on drafting this um, a while back, this was something that was very important to uh, domestic uh, violence uh, victims and, uh, and their advocates. Um, and there are actually, for instance, carve outs in the federal homeless management information system specifically for the kinds of information that can be shared about and, and not shared uh, about um, uh, victims. And so calling this out was something that was important uh, at the time. I haven't gone back and compared this to the bill that you all passed last year uh, on domestic violence um, to see if maybe that's now covered, um, but just wanted to make the point that I, I think probably it would be a good thing to leave this language in. Okay. Those are my comments. Thank you. So we will ask um, we will ask Luke to draft up to to do the full strike all on this bill. In my hearing consensus that public accommodation is a sufficient definition with the two provisos that Tommy put in, the two additions. And that's what we will ask to see for the next the next time we take this up. What about the inclusion of the domestic uh I'm fine keeping it in. I seem to remember it's older language that, that was, but if... Do we, want, do we need to hear from domestic violence advocates or um, just put it back in? I think we just keep it in. Okay. No. What about referencing the, the law that was passed last year? It's, or looking at it to see if it, it already includes homeless individuals? Um, I don't believe it does, my memory, if my memory serves correctly, and, I, and Earhart's memory, I think, of using the homeless management information system, that I think that, that clarifies the conversation we had on this two years ago. Um, but we can, you know, we can certainly, I believe I saw Kara Casey in the building today, um, where we can send it, or if you want to reach out to, if you can reach out to them, that would be, Fine. Um, so getting away from <clears throat> definitions uh, on how we're going to lay those out and into just more of like the totality of the picture, um, are we going to talk to anybody uh, from like the mayor's organizations or EPA or anything like that to talk about how they see this from a point of engagement? Uh, you know, we've put this out. Uh, the um, leaders of cities and towns have, have testified on it. I think, I mean, uh, my concern is if they haven't heard about it already or haven't offered anything already, then do they have something to offer? Um, I suppose, I mean, we, we clearly will have another session on this because we have to review the changes made. I think we're really close in terms of settling the issues now that it becomes just a question of whether there's support in the committee for the bill. Okay. And, the, and the different changes. Um, that said, if we we don't have a time, I don't know that we have a time schedule here tomorrow for this, but it's um, so we would go over into next week, probably for final vote. I mean, if somebody wants to reach out and see, that's fine. It would be one more opportunity, but um, again, it's one of those. It's not finished here either. Yeah, there you go. If, if it passes here, then and people have. More comments than, than the Senate is yeah. more than willing to take them on to. Yeah, I'm just curious because we, we just didn't, other than whatever that was, 15, 20 minutes with me, it's been Karen Horn. Uh, yeah, it's nobody, been, nobody it's, really from the municipality side has come in yet, so I just wasn't sure what they. Yeah, I would think that if that. Karen Horn was aware of it, that she would have notified okay. other people through BOCT, but I'm making an assumption of that case. But again, no one is. Uh, you know, we've reached out to we reached out to Burlington earlier to see who was interested in talking, and, and um, the chamber spoke. The chamber spoke. We reached out to police association. Um, we did. We had at one point we thought we were going to have testimony from police officers or no, police chief. That's kind of what I'm curious about. That we didn't see anybody from the enforcement. They, they didn't want to come in. 
I, I think there was a real split between what someone may want to testify on a personal experience, personal professional experience versus what they might have been, what their municipality may have wanted them to test. I mean, you know, just who knows? Speculation. You know, yeah. I think the opportunities have been out there. Okay. And, um, and again, it's part of, you know, here we are in the middle of February. Um, I think we've, I think we've philosophized this bill upside down and backwards and we've really worked the language yeah. to try to get it right. So, um, or as right as we can get it.